Welcome everyone, Kostin here with my campaign overview guide for Helmen Gorst of the Vampire Counts in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. The man, the legend, the meme lord, the zombie lord of Warhammer 3. This guy has been on a warpath ever since Warhammer 3 came out. He is by far and away one of the strongest legendary lords in the game. In fact, you can genuinely contend for the top one spot. I think it would be interesting to see how that competition would play out. But before I talk about Gorst and what makes him so incredibly powerful, let's talk about what makes the Vampire Counts so very powerful. First off, it's their recruitment. So they have regular recruitment, though they lack global recruitment. Their special recruitment, however, is raising the dead. And with Raise the Dead, you can get a very powerful army very, very quickly. Like, this is turn one. I start with 13 units, and within the first turn, I can get 18. And that's just in the starting province that I have. I move a province over, I'm at the full stack of units from turn one. There are some legendary lords that are ridiculous in this game, but none can match the sheer potential of a vampire counts legendary lord in terms of the early game strengths. And that matters because a lot of campaigns will be uh, dictated by how well you do in the early game. If you're playing the Vampire Counts, you're just gonna dominate the early game, as any of the Legendary Lords that you do decide to play. Some better than others at this. That's just from uh, the perspective of unit recruitment. Now, the units themselves are not necessarily that great, at least when it comes to auto resolve, but they certainly can be really good in terms of an actual battle. Like zombies, for instance, the most basic, meaningless unit that you can recruit, have a significant amount of HP for uh, over here. So they can work as a really powerful meat wall. Then you have good hero choices longer uh, and good army choices throughout. I personally have a liking for Graveguard just because they have a good amount of armor, a good amount of leadership, though it's not, it's, it's certainly not a top tier and thus can do pretty well in terms of resolve. Late game, you have things like Blood Knights, you have Black Knights, uh, you do have uh, ghost units, all that kind of stuff. Hero choices, you do have your necromancers, your uh, white uh, white uh, king, your banshees, and then your vampires. Now, the vampires are incredibly powerful because they're good casters, but they're also really potent in a melee situation. Lore choice-wise, uh, you have uh, master necromancers, Strigoi ghoul kings, and vampire lords by default. Uh, each benefiting different types of units. But here's the thing. As any vampire count, legendary lord, regardless of who you choose to play, you can awaken dynasties. Like the blood dragon will give you unit experience, weapon strength, and raise dead pool capacity for blood knights if you get this all the way to tier 3. So you, you want to awaken one lord of a dynasty, then you awaken second, then a third, and that's how you get these bonuses. Um, the Von Karstein gives you casualty replenishment control uh, to all provinces, as well as Sylvanian crossbowmen and handgunners. So you can get some ranged options. Uh, the Lamians uh, give you character experience, diplomatic relations, campaign line of sight. Uh, the Necrox uh, give you research, upkeep, wins of magic. And then the Strigoi give you raise dead pull, ambush chance, raise dead pull. Um, and you, you get the raise dead pull capacity for crypt goals and crypt horrors as well as vampire corruption, though that's not too important. And of course, whenever you awaken a lord of a dynasty, you get a powerful legendary lord as well, though just bear in mind, you might be able to lose them. So the vampire uh, counts are powerful in terms of lords, heroes, units, and they also have a pretty strong, solid economy. At tier one, they have a building that gives them uh, 250 income and one control. At tier three, they get 500 income. As an idea, this is the same that the Empire gets for its main economic building. So it is incredibly potent. Then they have good growth, good control, various structures to support that. So they're a powerful race. The only real downsides is they are lacking in range significantly, even with Sylvanian crossbowmen and handgunners. They have no artillery. And one major downside is that their units actually won't route from the battlefield. Now, it's a positive in that units will fight to the death, but it's a negative in that if units fight to the death, 
there won't be any of them retreating and surviving the battle, which can be an issue when we're talking about armies. With lords and heroes, being unbreakable is not the problem, but certainly it is a problem with uh, the vampire units, because once their leadership breaks, it, they will crumble into dust. The Creative Assembly has changed how that works during the course of, uh, of a battle. Their research tree is also highly beneficial. They've got a lot of things going for them. Now, to talk about Gorst, he takes the strengths of the Vampire Counts and he ups them to 11. Faction-wide benefits, he gets lesser raised dead for Corpse Guard than Mortis Engines. He gets raised dead pull capacity for zombies, casualty replenishment 10%, pretty substantial casualty replenishment faction-wide, and you can improve it even further. And he gives poison attacks for zombies, skeletal spearmen, and skeletal warriors. Uh, poison attacks will weaken the units, their fighting will cause them to do less damage, so it will increase their survivability. But then there's Gorst himself. He gets immune to plague attrition, uh, immune to contact effects, and he gets 30 armor for zombies and crypt goals. But that's just the start. His special skill line is where things get absolutely freaking insane. He gets 12 melee attack for all zombies faction-wide, 10 ward save, a battle healing cap increase of 500%, and then uh, he gets Ever Onward, which gives Zombies the Ravenous Dead, Weapon Strength 50%, with a magic cost minus 2 for uh, that one ability. Now, but the Ravenous Dead is really the important aspect here, because it means with this particular skill upgrade, Zombies will be constantly replenishing HP while in combat. There are, there are other ways to do it. And then there's, of course, other benefits over here when it comes to casualty replenishment, upkeep for zombies, uh, upkeep for skeletal warriors, uh, significant benefit across the board, significant benefits when it comes to raise dead. But the true benefit for Helm and Gorst is that he can maintain some very powerful armies of zombies that can be very cheap. We're talking here like a thousand uh, upkeep or even less, potentially, dependent on the units, where the Lord might... Uh, uh, might uh, be responsible for a lot of the upkeep. Like this, for instance, is a 2000 army upkeep, but much of that upkeep is actually coming from the Mortis engine, from Gorst himself, from the White King. The zombies themselves are a mere 19 upkeep, and you can get entire stacks of units, uh, of ar uh, you can get entire armies filled to the brim with zombies that, mm, that you can maintain for very, very cheap, and you can reduce the cost even further. It is absolutely ridiculous. And because of the significant combat strength that um, you do get with zombies, it means that rolling over your enemies with sheer zombies, with the sheer number of zombies, is a perfectly viable and very strong campaign tactic. It's not something I prefer because you would still have to fight a lot of battles manually. You can recover from them very easily, but to really utilize the armies that Ghost has in the most effective manner, you'd have to fight a bunch of pointless battles manually, and I'll be honest, that's not fun. It is powerful, it is effective, it's just not necessarily the most fun campaign style. So that's the benefits he provides on a faction level. He's also He also counts himself they quite a lot uh, towards the balance of power in battles. He can be pretty durable as a lord as well, though he won't necessarily do a lot of damage. But just bear in mind, you don't have to play Gorse as just a pure zombie fiesta. You can use zombie armies to supplement the real vampire count uh, forces. So you can go with grave guards, you can go with mortis engines, you can go with cavalry. You can have a proper army, just use the zombies as a, the tanks of the army and annihilate your enemies, get the zombies engaged. Once all the enemy units are engaged, once the zombies have soaked up damage, send the real force to deal with the issue. So you don't just have to play Gorst as a pure vampiric faction. Now, let's talk about campaign plan. So you start over here in the Hunted Forest. Now, the Hunted Forest will give you the special building, which will can generate extra income. And, of course, you can issue a commandment. Now, your campaign situation, looking at uh, the situation, your short campaign victory condition uh, require you to take out the parks makers of Nurgle and take, uh, take over this settlement. This uh, settlement will, however, be a problem because while it looks 
uh, ruined, it's not. There's a tier five Skaven settlement here is going to be an absolute nightmare to do. So even as course, I would not necessarily focus too much on this unless you can fi send five stacks at it of zombies, then that they'll, they'll probably win. Your long campaign victory conditions, and I think this doesn't really make sense for Gorst, I think they should change this, but your long campaign victory condition is to destroy the Reichland and basically take control of the Empire. That's probably something they should update, but you can certainly reach the Empire before you reach 75 Occupied Loot or Raised or Sacked uh, 75 Settlement. And you might want to do so just to get uh, Castle Drakenhof to Confederate Vlad for other benefits as well. So you're on a journey, but you don't necessarily need to go on the journey of the Empire. Early on, you do have this cave faction that controls Noblar uh, country. I'm not sure how long that's going to last, uh, how long these cavemen are going to last over here, but they are your immediate concern. Once you wipe them out, what should you do? It is a good question. You do have various options. You will take Flayed Rock. So you'll take, uh, I'd recommend taking uh, the camp here, then uh, the scrap towers, and then finally flayed rock. Once all of that is take, uh, taken out, what should you do afterwards in your campaign? Well, you have a choice. Uh, you have a couple of choices. You could eliminate um, Nurgle. You could eliminate Kugaf before he becomes an issue. And you're certainly well positioned uh, to do so. You'll have the army for that. That would be a strong recommendation. After that, what you decide to do is really up to you. You could go into the Mountains of Morn. You can go into the West to deal with Emrek. You can go into Cafe if you so desire. Though, just bear in mind that there's there's a good amount of territory you can take in Cafe. And really, the ca this campaign should be about taking Cafe. Because a lot of the territory is very suitable with the exception of the Savannah. Um, but you can go into Cafe, pick a war with Xiao Ming, Miao Ying. If you do that quickly enough... Uh, you'll, uh, you'll, you could potentially ally Snitch and to take out the two mega ca cafe and factions, or you could head north directly on a confrontation of Grimgore. You can head west. You do have various choices in this campaign. Personally, I would take out the Skaven initially, then take out Kugaf, uh, then probably take out Emrek before he becomes too much of a threat. So start taking over this entire territory, go take Craven Tail, and start making my way into the Empire. To take over Vlad's operation in Sylvania. Would I conquer the entirety of the Empire? Potentially not. Though if you can, uh, I'm not sure if you can confederate Vlad von Karstein, but if you can, if you can get Vlad uh, playing as Gorst, then that's a significant power spike. The reason that's the case is because Vlad himself is worth an entire army, and imagine Vlad with an army of zombies, he'd, he'd just annihilate everything in his path. Long term, you can head over here. Like, there's a lot of territory that's very suitable to Gorse. This is the power he has as a campaign. It's not that he just has powerful armies. It's not that he's playing a powerful race. It's also the fact that he can expand across the territory. There's very little in terms of terrain types that are not suited for him. Like, you've got, you've got Magical Forest, you've got Wasteland, you've got Mountain, you've got Temperate, and you've got Desert. Speaking about Magical Forest... That's a pretty important one, by the way. The reason it's so important is it means you can take the entirety of Athel Lauren with its juicy, juicy settlements with a lot of uh, slots in them and turn them into the heart of your empire, if you so desire. So lots of choices in this campaign. I don't like the battle play style, but when we're looking at campaign mechanics and the campaign situation, it's actually a really great campaign from that particular perspective. And it has a lot on offer. Anyway, that's all there is to say. Questine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications. If you do enjoy my content, donate via PayPal or Patreon. I'd greatly appreciate it in this time.